Howdy, gang. Welcome to Moz. Welcome back to Moz, if you've been here before. How many of you have been to our offices at some point in the last, this, this office in particular? Yes. All right. A lot of you. Great. That's terrific. Also, props to you, sir, for having a bow tie on. I really, that means a lot to me. Um, feels like I, I'm not the only one with something dressing up here. Uh, so we have, I, I'm actually going to go a little more uh, deep in depth, so I, I hope, uh, Dominic, you don't mind, but um, I figured it was okay to get a little hardcore deep into some SEO trends. I, I wasn't entirely sure how super SEO geeky you all are, but I, I'm like crazy SEO geeky, right? Like, here's an example. Um, I really wish that I could have played Dungeons and Dragons when I was like in high school and college, but I was so dorky that no one would play with me. Um, and now lots of people are willing to play SEO with me. Uh, in fact, people are even willing to pay me money to play SEO with them. I don't know why they do that. But I, I did think one of the interesting things we could do is dive into some big trends. It's the beginning of the year still, right, February? And, and talk about things that I believe are going to dominate 2015 in terms of our conversations around where SEO is going and, and, and a little bit about where it's been. And one of the first ones, and most frustrating ones, although several of these unfortunately are a little, a little frustrating, is dark traffic. So dark traffic is basically when you look at your referral traffic, right, like all the sources that send you traffic in whatever analytics program you use, Omniture or uh, uh, Google Analytics or Stack Counter, whatever you've got. You, you should see, what you should see is, uh, are all the, the uh, strings and data, right, and the URLs that sent you traffic. Google sent you this much traffic. It came from this keyword. Uh, Bing sent you this much. These referring sites sent you this much. Uh, these social networks sent you this much. That's not what ha happens. That's not what happens. So uh, this is a screenshot from my Android device, right? And I did a search for museum. I just typed in museum. And it okay, like, I, I think this is a search query. I don't know about you, I think that's a search query. What happens if you click on that result there? No referral, direct, that's exactly right, direct. Direct traffic. I, I think that's baloney. Same is true for some kinds of desktop searches too. If I start searching museum, you, this isn't a perfect example, but if I start typing in things that Google thinks might be a URL, it will suggest things to me just like it would with search suggest or just like it would even more so with the 10 blue links, right, the results. But if I, if I click one of those, right, if I'm like, oh, yeah, let's check out museum.tv. I was actually going to search for Museum of History, but sure, I'll go check that out. That is also direct. That's a direct refer. This one's a little fudgier. I think maybe you could make a reasonable case that it is, although I wish Google would pass some sort of refer, like FYI, someone typed something in that led you, them to you. Dark social, also a huge problem, right? Google is not entirely to blame for this. Uh, here we go. This, this is uh, from Chartbeat, who I think does a, a pretty solid job. I, I trust their methodology. Uh, I did some deep digging into it uh, when this article came out. And, and so of the 100% of, of social traffic that's sent, dark social is more than half. More than half, that's ridiculous. Totally ridiculous. A ton of that, by the way, most of that dark social is Facebook. It is Facebook's apps on tablet and on mobile devices. Um, but we think some of it might be dark social from web as well. Twitter seems to be pretty good about passing refer string. Pinterest, I'm not totally sold. I, I haven't de deep dug into their uh, mobile and tablet, but it just sucks. Uh, there's some, from the Chartbeat blog, they actually put together a list of like which ones are passing refers correctly and not correctly. But you can see dark traffic, huge problem. Half your social referrals, some substantive percentage of your search traffic, probably a lot of your mobile search traffic. And what does that mean? It's like Rodney Dangerfield said, man, you just, you will get no respect. You're going to go and be like, hey, we drove 
uh, you know, we did a ton of investment on Facebook this quarter. We did a ton of investment in SEO this quarter. And look at the results. And they're going to be like, yeah, look, looks all right. But, you know, it, it seems like direct traffic is big. I think our brand ads are really working. And you, that's when your eyes just get really big and the fire gets in them and you start all, all the words coming out of your mouth are like things that would happen when you hit shift and the number keys on the keyboard. I, I think this is going to be a dominating issue for a long time until we figure out ways to combat it. And I think that's going to happen two ways. One, we are going to start building things off of correlation. Like we marketers are going to go, hmm, it sure is suspicious that this, face, that this URL got a lot of shares on Facebook. And then it also suddenly that same time period got a lot of direct traffic. We're going to do a bunch of that manually. And then I think the technology is going to catch up and uh, analytics refers will start giving us some inferred traffic sources, some suggested traffic sources, likely traffic sources, et cetera. Well, I hope so anyway. I doubt Google Analytics will do this, which means kind of cool. We'll get to pay for analytics tools again, and they'll probably do all sorts of other sweet stuff for us. Uh, second big one. I think we're going to keep having, and if it hasn't already started, I think we're going to start having and keep having this big debate about the power of links in SEO. There's, there's little doubt that like uh, you point a bunch of links at something, and it will rise in the rankings. I think there is some doubt about whether other factors are growing in importance and, and how so. So, all right, let, let's look back a couple of years. Here's uh, right correlations for backlink metrics hovering at about 0 0.29. But this is not important to know the exact number, but here it is a year later at 0 0.31. Here it is this year at 0 0.30. So see, the correlations, right? Like correlations with things that rank higher than other things with having more links, well, it's a, it stayed pretty similar, right? Pretty darn similar. And what's weird is we're seeing other factors on the rise, right? Engagement types of metrics, things that are well correlated with brand, things are, that are very well correlated with uh, user and usage data types of things, of which engagement is one kind. So as these things rise, does that mean that links are shrinking? Does that mean that links are somehow less valuable if these other factors are going up? I don't actually think so necessarily, and, and I'll, I'll show you how. But uh, does, is everyone here, are you familiar with pogo sticking? Familiar with pogo sticking? Yes, one person and Justin. You're, you're also a person. I didn't mean to suggest that. I'm sorry. I just know you by name. Okay. So you guys can tune out for the next, like, 30 seconds. But uh, so basically pogo sticking is the idea that I a, uh, click on a Google link, right, something that shows up in the Google results, and I get over to a page, and then I'm like, uh, this kind of sucks. And I immediately click the back button and click some other link. And Google calls that pogo sticking, so does Bing. Uh, and pogo sticking is a behavior that they hate, right? They really want to avoid that. If they see that happening in search results, especially consistently from lots of users that they can verify are real users and not bots, please don't go create bot farms right after hearing this talk. Please don't do that. Uh, it won't work anyway. But if they see that kind of behavior over and over again, what happens to their op opinion of your site? <laughs> Correct again, sir. Uh, so this, this is one way they're sort of measuring engagement. And I think they're doing a much better job. In fact, I don't think it's very arguable. They're doing a considerably better job over the last three, four years, cracking down on manipulative links, which has made the link graph overall of higher quality. But, uh, and, and it's not just those manipulative links that are losing value. I think there's also a lot of what I'd call cruft in the web's deep, dark corners that no longer has the same ability to influence search results that it did two, three, four, five, six years ago, right? We've, we've moved a lot beyond page rank and raw links and those kinds of things. But that being said, I think it might be a mistake to look at the, to think of the algorithm like this. If you think the algorithm is a pie chart and so, oh, look, this thing is getting bigger, right? Like, I, I think user and usage data is getting bigger. I think maybe social media types of data is getting bigger. Okay, but that doesn't actually mean that link-based or correlate, uh, uh, citation-based data is shrinking because the pie chart is actually the wrong way to think about this. 
The right way to think about it would be more like a stack, right? That, that like links can take you up and they can keep taking you up. And then other things can add on top of that, right? Google has no, no ranking algorithm necessarily has to say like, oh, this can only matter this much and then you max out. Like you can just keep going. So, all right. Number three, well, <laughs> so, you know, Dominic talked uh, eloquently about content marketing. I agree, has incredible power, incredible opportunity. We're also inundated with it. Like, overwhelmingly inundated with content. I, I think that in the, uh, 90 seconds that I glanced down at my phone during Dominic's presentation, maybe it's two minutes, I apologize. I shouldn't be doing that, it's just a bad habit. But I, I probably saw and scrolled through 150 pieces of content that I could have clicked on. I, I didn't click on any of them, I don't think. Maybe I clicked on one. But this is happening to all of us. Like we are getting really good at going through hundreds of pieces of content in seconds and ignoring almost all of it, unless something catches our eye. You know what else is like that? The rise of ads on the internet. Do you guys remember back in the day, like you go to the Yahoo homepage, you'd be like, ooh, look at this ad. And like they had, they had like one or 2% click through rate. Like one out of every 100 people who saw an ad on Yahoo would click on that ad. It made them, you know, well, Jerry and Jerry, right? It made them billionaires. It was, it was cool, kind of. And then we all got super inundated with ads and used to them and ad click-through rates went to nothing, right? And now I think um, you're more likely to have seen Pluto Nash. Do you remember the, the Eddie Murphy like box office flop? You're more likely to have seen that in the theaters than you are to have clicked on a banner ad. Like, just terrible, terrible ad click-through rate. And I think we're gonna see something really, so this is science, by the way, I want you to know, I researched how many people went to see that at the box office and like did the math, it is solid. Uh, I think we're gonna see something similar with content, right? Where, where you're, we're gonna be exposed to so much of it and the click-through rates are gonna drop because we can't consume that much more. Like there's just not room in our lives. I need to watch my shows, you know, like, I think unless the content you're producing is of extremely high quality, it's not gonna be that worthwhile to even hit the publish button. This, this is my guess. And actually there's some data suggests it's already happening. So this is a distribution from simple reach of the uh, buckets of content, percentile buckets of content, and the uh, traffic that they get from social networks. It's like a freaking income distribution chart in San Francisco or something. like. No offense to, some offense to San Francisco. I, you, they should work on that. But we need to work on it too. They need to work on it more. But so, right, like look at the, the top 1% getting like 60% of all the clicks, all the traffic, that's insane. Totally insane. So basically, unless you say, I believe we can be in the top five, top 10% of content that is produced in our field, unless you th are pretty confident that you will be better than nine out of 10 practitioners of content marketing in your field, I'm not sure I would urge you to invest in it. I'm not sure I would tell you that is the best way you can spend your marketing dollars and people's time. Despite that, <laughs> um, the industry clearly doesn't care what I have to say about this subject, but that's a, which is fine, which is fine, but, but like there, there's gonna be massively more investments. And so I, I worry that this distribution is going to get worse unless we can find ways to get human attention spans to be longer or more hours in the day, or maybe they can consume content faster, buy more things per pieces of content they're exposed to. Uh, number four among big trends, I think we're gonna keep seeing visuals dominate, absolutely dominate. And one of the reasons is actually linked to the previous one, which is basically that you just don't, you don't have time to consume all this stuff. Fastest growing social networks, those are visual, right? Visuals, this is one of my favorite things. So uh, let's say that you are getting into a debate with someone about uh, climate change or um, the benefits of vaccinating. Um, I hope you never have to deal with either of those, but let's say that tragically you do. And, and so you could say, well, it has been proven that uh, 
you know, vaccines have reduced the death rate from measles by, uh, you know, from 10% of children to um, literally no deaths in the last decade until like last year. I blame that on Jenny McCarthy. Um, but, right, you could, you could tell them that, and that would be perceived as an argument. Like that's perceived as an opening salvo, and now they can respond. But if you show that data visually in a chart, it's perceived as fact. It's very, very weird. Like, if I were gonna get in a presidential debate, I would be like, I'm not saying shit. Number, number, chart, data, Venn diagram, and then fingers crossed, probably wouldn't work. Uh, but visuals, incredible. You can see correlations with Twitter, right? Visuals just work better, get more retweets, more favorites. But, it, these are like the three kinds of images that I keep seeing marketers invest in. The stock generic image, stock photography combined with generic crappiness equals stock generic. The borporate is both boring and corporate. And sadly, the allegographic, which no one can fricking read. This, don't, don't invest in these forms of visual content, please. Please. All right, last one. Mobile experience. So I, I, I think it's not just that mobile is growing, it is growing and growing fast, but I think it's also that mobile is more than apps. So there was like this sort of meme in the technology world and web world that like mobile uh, apps were gonna completely dominate, right? Mo mobile apps are 80% of time spent, now, then they're gonna be 86% of time spent. Um, uh, I could not find it, but well, I couldn't find a visual of it and didn't have time to make my own, but if you um, remove games from this, uh, it drops in half. And if you remove Facebook, which I don't really see the difference between using the Facebook app or the Facebook website. They function exactly the same, they refer traffic the same, except the Facebook website tells you it refers traffic and the app doesn't. Then it's down to like 15% because we basically use Google Maps. And then we play games and go on Facebook. So, well, Twitter, but you know. Uh, mobile web usage, actually massive too. In fact, mobile web usage, so big that it's just almost as big as web usage, like desktop web usage. So, if, which has not shrunk, by the way, right? Like this, see the line, how it's straight, pretty straight. So yes, desktop, not growing anymore, we sort of reached equilibrium there. Mobile web traffic, still growing. Pretty awesome. And search too, right? Mobile search just keeps on growing. Uh, in fact, I think Google said last year was gonna be the year that mobile search surpassed desktop search. I'm not, I haven't heard confirmation from them whether it actually did, but that's what they said. You know this as well, right? Um, the US sort of being a semi-exception here, thanks to, well, mostly lobbyists, right? They're able to protect, um, we can call it a 4G LTE plus, and we only have to make it like a megabyte faster, and if you download a lot of stuff, then screw you, we're gonna make it slower for you, and that's our constitutionally protected right to do that, which is whatever, but uh, the, our expectations have not kept up with the speed. So basically, what, we, what you're finding is uh, really weird stuff where people four years ago, three years ago, yeah, three years ago, 2012, had an expectation that like web pages would load in less than four seconds. So you really had to get web page speed to like under four seconds. Now it, it's like two. Two! And speeds haven't gotten faster. Your Comcast at home still sucks. It does, it sucks, right? And like. Compared to Europe, compared to Asia, like our high-speed internet, mostly from the two big providers, really, really sucks. Our 4G speeds suck compared to Europe and Asia. So it's just, it's getting weird. But we expect this, I think that is because web developers, app builders, have gotten so good at eking every last optimization piece out of the speed that they create, right? Like what? What is Facebook doing while you are browsing, you know, you're looking at your friend's like new baby, and what's Facebook doing? In the background, it's 
freaking loading all the next posts that you might look at. It's predictively saying, oh my God, he might click here. Quick, load that, load that in the background. That's super smart. It means that when you do scroll or you do click, they've already preloaded it. It makes it seem really fast. Then you start expecting it to be really fast. But I, I don't know about you, but Moz, we don't have 500 engineers who can build prefetching software for our mobile you know, web app. Sorry, I, I don't know how to do that. I know how to do that. I just don't have the people and the resources to do that. And so that makes it really tough for smaller and medium-sized businesses to try and compete on the mobile web. And I think there's UX implications as well, right? We expect the web and in all things digital that we interact with to start working in these intuitive kinds of ways, right? In these simplistic intuitive kinds of ways. And that is making you know, demand on developers, demand on designers just that much harder. All right, so I, this is a little bit doom and gloomy, but I, I think we still have an opportunity to go forth and optimize for this stuff, keeping it in mind, making our teams, our bosses, our clients aware of this, uh, and, and knowing how to get over things like dark traffic, knowing how to optimize visuals that work, knowing how to create expectations around mobile, knowing what's happening with uh, social. This, this stuff is coming, some of it's here already, but uh, we need not fear because we are prepared. Thanks very much.